Welcome to Business Live, where we take a look at the topical business and economic issues in the country. And before we bring you our business news roundup, let's go to the very first story. And Minerals Commission said it was compelled by law to grant stability agreement to mining firm Goldfields. The agreement, which government, uh, the agreement with government will see Goldfields pay a fixed tax and royalty rate for the next 11 years. Chief Executive of the Commission, Dr. Tony Aubin, told Joy Business they had no option but to grant Goldfields requests. So I think it's been the largest single investor in this country, if, if my calculations are right. If we invested close to $2 billion uh, across the two mines and they intend investing more, so they, they qualify by our own law for them to sit with, upon the recommendation of the Minerals Commission, as the law says, to sit with the minister, um, you know, get into a development agreement. The second thing is also looking at the realities of our time. We see that without, in fact, with a diamond mine, without any assurance of a certain stability, the mine was going to go away. And Takwa Mine's life was going to reduce drastically. We know the implications of closing a mine uh, around this time. We know the challenges of the industry. So I think government took a strategic decision to uh, respond positively to go that was the chief executive officer of the Minerals Commission. Now, the government's granting of a development agreement to Goldfields Ghana has been clearly described as unconstitutional and illegal by the Third World Network Africa, a civil society organization. The concession is primarily to prevent the biggest investor, Goldfields Ghana, from total collapse. The coordinator of the Third World Network for Africa, Dr. Yao Graham, at a press conference today, however, described the entire process as unconstitutional and therefore illegal. We need to know what Goldfields is planning to invest because you only get a development agreement in respect of prospective investment, not because you've been around so long that it's like a kind of pension award, no. Prospective investment. Where is the text and the terms of the 500 million or more dollars investment that Goldfields is going to make, which justifies a development agreement. Because everything that Goldfields officials have said, they have been very clear that they have not made any commitments. They have not made any commitments. I've read a number of things, and it's clear that they have not made any commitments. This is it's a welcome development they will take into account when they are taking their decision about the future. But they haven't made any commitments. This is what they are saying. Clearly, they are saying something which means that the Ghana government has done something on some assumptions. So we need to know what the terms that justify the development agreement is. Three, we are saying that the stability, fiscal stability terms of the agreement as published by Goldfields is illegal because fiscal stability terms under Section 48 are in respect of the future, not the past. So we, we believe that this is an illegality, which is a very dangerous precedent because every company who is in the mining sector is distressed by gold prices or not. And the thing to ask is when the good terms are on, why don't the companies prepare for all we all know is the volatility you know, of, of, of mineral prices? We think this is an illegality and also sets a very dangerous precedent. And we challenge the government to prove that the stability terms, the fiscal stability terms, the new sliding scale, the reduction in, in, uh, in uh, sliding royalty rates, and also the, the reduction in corporate raise that is often new more. We challenge the government to prove to us that it is not illegal. Asking, we want to know who are involved in negotiating this agreement? Is it, an, is it the minister on the advice of the Minerals Commission? Is it part of the fiscal, of the, uh, the negotiation reform thing that is going on? Because we know that the committee has been talking to all the a number of companies. Is this one of their products? Or this is, what, what's the connection? Or is this an example of the disastrous thing that the Kufo government signed in the corner of Newmont? Are we back in those kind of dark days you know, of, of corner agreements which undermine you know, the, the national interest? We need some answers. We're also asking questions about the role of parliament. Parliament needs to come clear about the term, its 
how it was you know, assured that there was a justification for development agreement. To inter the committee report, I think we are entitled to see, OK, and how parliament justify this. Parliament should also show us what justification was offered by government. Because usually, things go with a covering memo that the government offered as a basis for bringing this thing to parliament. We also want parliament to justify to us why it waived the notice period and rush this agreement through. Because on the face of it, it seems to us that this is an arbitrary and capricious exercise. All right, so that was Dr. Yao Graham. Now, I've been joined by John Amwaku, who attended the press conference today, and he's here to tell us more about what the Third World Network hopes to press home. John, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. So before you even start, what's this whole thing about mining agreements and uh, why... Development agreement and development stabilization and agreement. agreement. Exactly. exactly. You know, um, with the development and the, the exploration and exploitation of mineral resources, be it gold, diamond, bauxite, yeah. oil, gas, whatever. I mean, before you start with the um, exploration, you need to sit down with the government or the state to actually look at the way forward. What agreement would you have? One of those is the development and the stability agreement. Okay. And a development agreement is simply the fact that, one, you, the company, promising the state to invest some quantum or amount of money and by that, you're going to generate some employment, create, a, create employment. Actually, you make our fiscal situation better okay. for some reliefs. And by the reliefs, it can be tax incentives. Okay? It, can, it, it could be so many things. All right? So that is what we call the development agreement, something to help you mm -hmm. to actually have the ease of mind, the ease of the fiscal space to develop and for, your, for, your, for, your, for the mine or that okay. company, that extractive company, to become Love a big it. one that all it would expect. Okay. So that's basically what development agreement is. But well. within that, we have what we call the fiscal or the, 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 stability. the stability agreement as well. Stability agreement simply is that fiscal space given to companies to operate. And by fiscal space, what I mean is, is that you, they give them tax incentives tax holidays and tax breaks, or sometimes they have what we call the decline tax and other holidays, meaning that, for example, if it's gold, as in when gold prices drop, okay. the taxes that you pay also drops, basically. So that is that, that comes under the, the, the stability agreement. But right. usually, when they say development agreement, it encompasses the uh, stability, stability agreement, agreement as well, mo most of the time. All right, yes. very well. Now, barely two weeks ago, when you know government decided to pass that stability agreement, with um, um, gold fields, mm. it was criticized by a section of the, I mean, the public, exactly. uh, basically stakeholders. Now, the, the Dr. Tony Orban, that's the chief executive officer of the Minerals Commission, came out to justify it. I mean, the reason why it's been given to gold fields. Why is it now that um, the Third World Network is criticizing this uh, agreement okay. as unconstitutional? Exactly. And exactly. Let me let me uh, so sort of like put it in perspective. You know, Dr. Tony, I've been representing the, the CEO of the Minerals Commission, Parliament, and the government, I mean, as a whole, are sort of like uh, talking and then doing this thing on behalf of the state, whilst the Third Ed Network, represented by Dr. Uh, Yao Graham, is also a civil society company, also wanting the best for the state. That's exactly what it is. But then, let me, this morning press conference, as organized by the Third World Network, Network, actually what it is is that they, they, so the, the baseline and the bottom line is that or the premise, the argument or the debate on the constitution and then the laws which actually establishes the, st the, stability, the, the stability agreement and the development agreement, meaning the constitution and the other laws which establish all these things. And what they are saying is that one, mm. per the laws regulating the mining and then the extractive sector, what did, let, me, let, let me see if I can actually this section uh, 48 of Act 703 on the stability agreement and then uh, 49 mm. of that same. And then they also did quote the article uh, 296 of the 1992 constitution which says that uh, natural resources are actually taken care of by the state on behalf of the people. Okay, so okay. anything the government or the state would do must be done to the benefit or advantage of the people. So, so John, what, what is the that, illegality here? The what illegality is simply at? that one, they yeah. say, according to the, uh, the Third World Network, represented yeah. by Dr. Yao Graham, yeah. what he's yeah. saying is that, one, the, uh, the development agreement entered into 
with the uh, with uh, what do you call um this uh, mining, gold fields. Gold fields mining company yes. was illegal because it actually violated the article uh, section 48 of act 703 okay. which requires that before you benefit from this development agreement you must have promised to invest a minimum of 500 million dollars before okay. you are entitled okay. to that development agreement but here Gophers did not do anything like that. All they did mm. was so like uh, they looked at their historical investment or spendings, mm. and he said, "No, that's not the case." So, so that doesn't mean that the regulator, the, the Minerals Commission, overlooked this. Uh, uh, it's not even about the regulator. Important. I think it's about Parliament. You know, Parliament debated this. It went through the committee stage uh, before it came to the plenary for. Uh, further discussion, it was approved. But the point is this: if he even questioned the speed with which this process actually went through, he thought that they, they, they should have actually taken some time of themselves to actually look at this thing very, very well and comprehensively. So, but that is what it is. They are saying that one, the rate at the speed with which the the the, the, the bill pal went through Parliament was something that smacked of, okay. um, let's say, non-transparency, non okay. number one. Suspicion. Number two, so, exactly, I don't want mm. to use that word <laughs> like to, you know, yes. that. Okay, good. Mm. Number two, uh, Goldfields has not promised anywhere that they were going to invest five, 500 million okay. as uh, required by law to benefit Does that from promise this? have to come before exactly. the agreement? Exactly. Is okay. Otherwise, you, right. don't, you don't qualify mm. to benefit All from right. this development agreement. That is one. And then the second thing is that that secrecy in which this whole transa this transaction is shrouded in, mm. I think also they need answers to all these things okay, so, and so, all that. So basically so that is what you're asking So they come say what next is going to be the action after this? In fact, uh, mm. okay. Dr. Yael Graham said that even going to court is possible. But now okay. they, are caught, they are asking Parliament and all the stakeholders, including the Minerals Commission, to come, to, to come forth with the relevant information, even including right. past arrangements they've entered into between Newmont and Anglo Gorda Shanti. All, all these right. things, they still they think that. Thank now you very much, John, for anymore. that update. We'll come You're to you welcome. later on. That was John uh, Kujo Amwaku. We're now taking a break for the business roundup. All right, so you're welcome back to Business Live, and I've been joined in the studio by George Riafi, who is also correspondent here on Business, Joy Business, of course. Joy, George, you're welcome. Thank you, and that's yes. a breaking news that is what coming is a breaking in news, that exactly. uh, what we've picked up from the presidency is that uh, Isahayaku uh, has been confirmed as the governor of the Bank of Ghana. What we are picking is that his appointment takes effect from April 1 this year. So okay. Nashiru uh, Isahayaku, who was the second deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, has been confirmed by the president as the governor of the Bank of Ghana. Any reasons uh, for this? Well, as of now, we don't know the reasons or behind it, but if you could be following the news on Joy mm. Business, we have been reporting that uh, the announcement could be made very, very soon. That was even today or this week. And this is information that we picked up from the very, very credible source of the presidency, and a statement will be issued very, very soon. We don't know what went into this consideration, but a little bit about Dr. Isaiah Aku. He holds a, a master's in agriculture, or let me say a master's in economics. He also holds a PhD from the University of Georgia in political science. He worked as a governance expert at the State University of New York Center for International Studies. He mm -hmm. then moved on to the African Development Bank. And also remember that he was the boss at EDIVE here in Accra, Ghana. And mm -hmm. then he was nominated by the president of the Sepi deputy second deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana. He's mm -hmm. been there for just some two years, if I should say. Yeah, but George, you, you have been going to the world, I mean, the Bank of Ghana for some time. Do you know, is that personally, do you know this, uh, in, this in, 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 in terms of personality, yes. having engaged him, I think he's a nice guy. I think he comes of a very calm, very measured person. His exploits? Uh, exploit, I mean, you didn't get much in terms of the deputies, but okay. in terms of the personal relationship with him, I think he comes across as, let's just say, a fine gentleman. Mm. You think he's going to change anything um, by way of policies? That would be, you, you look at the IMF program, mm. and I've always said that whoever might come on board, there's little that person might do or can do, okay. because you have a framework that is guiding your policies and all those things. So you ask yourself that, what else can the person do? The person has been a second deputy. You've been able to listen or measure the mistakes that your senior or your, your, your boss had made. So everybody will be expecting that he coming in, he'll be able to correct the wrongs, if there were any, 
as a new governor of the Bank of Ghana. So as we speak right now, mm. if what we pick up from the president is anything to go by, then mm. he is the governor as we speak right now. So what will be, is going to be one of his first... I think it will be the Ghana mentality. city. Okay. It will be the Ghana city and how he maintains that discipline during an election year. Mm. The fact that he could tell government that, no, I would not pay this check. No, I won't print more Ghana cities. And that will be, the, I mean, that will be an evidence for us to see how tough Isayaku would be as a governor of the Bank of Ghana, or would it be a governor who would actually uh, just sit down and listen to the instructions of the president? Because mm. this is an election year, and everybody okay. would tell you our challenge as an economy right now has been the fact that the overruns that we saw in 2012. Mm. So if you have a tough person in there to check government that I will not print more Ghana cities, then that will be how we can test the might, if I should use that word in quotes, mm -hmm. of Dr. Isaku. Early on, before he was appointed, experts were saying, some experts were saying that the, 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 the government must maintain or must wait for you know, the next government uh, perhaps to appoint a, a new governor. Uh, what do you think about Those this? are questions as well, because you are just going a few months into elections. Would you want to wait post-election before you appoint a new governor? Because if I could refer back to the laws, I think you could, if once appointed, you have to serve for like four, four years exactly. before you can uh, get off the seat. Okay. But, uh, nobody can push you out. So everybody was thinking that, listen, President, hold on and let's finish the election. But well, we don't know what went into the president's decision. Because okay. indeed, engaging people within government, the argument is that they need someone there who can take decisions and firm decisions. And therefore, mm -hmm. we want to appoint a governor right now. All right, thank you very much for that update. Thank you. What is the name again? Isa Dr. Isahaku. Okay. Nashiru right. Isahaku. Nashiru. Quite a tongue twisting name. <laughs> Let's hope the best for him. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. That was George Riafe. And now we have a new governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Isahaku. And Nashiru Isahaku is the governor of the Central Bank who has been appointed just this evening by the president. And that's it for now, but we're taking a break for the business roundup. Don't go away yet. An agreement for the start of onshore oil and gas exploration in the Keta Basin of the Volta region has been finalized. President John Mahama has disclosed. Swiss African Oil Company, a subsidiary of Swiss African Petroleum AG and PET Volta Investments, have been awarded exploration and production license for the new block. This was further revealed by the president. He made the revelations in an address at the Deba of Chiefs at Anlo on Sunday. He said, before Parliament rose, it approved the exploration agreement, and so it opens the way for the company to begin oil and gas exploration. He was hopeful that the start of exploration activities in the Keta Delta block would create employment for the youth in communities within the basin and southern water area. The city demonstrated a rare performance to survive the seasonal first quarter blues by losing only 1.4% of its value against the dollar as compared to 14.6% in the same period last year. The local currency's performance is a departure from previous year's weak performance when the city gained notoriety for its consistent depreciation. In the first quarter of 2014, the city depreciated by close to 18% in a year that saw the central bank introduce a raft of forex messages which were later repealed after a severe backlash from the public. With Ghana going to the polls in with Ghana going to the polls in November, some analysts feared government's physical imprudence could translate into poor city performance amid poor forex inflows, especially due to lower prices of commodities. That was the Business News Roundup. Now, Beta Atubiga has just joined me uh, for the update on the stock market. Uh, Beta, good evening. Yeah, good evening. So how did it all end last week? Let's just have a recap of... Uh, okay, so last markets. week we had just four trading days on the market. We didn't see much activity in terms of the um, equity that actually exchanged hands on the market. We saw about 381,049 shares trading for the whole week. That's from Tuesday to Friday, and that gave us a sales value of 1.3 million Ghana cities. But when you compare to the previous week, you realize that it went down. That's a volume went down by 75. 
0.81%, and then the value of the equities that were traded went down by 47.26%. So in terms of that, we didn't see much. The worth of the exchange also went down marginally by about, about 24 million Ghana cities. And then when you look at the major indices, there was a further dip into the negative regions. The composite index closed at negative 4.28%, and the financial stock index closed at negative 5.68%. And when you compare it to week open, there was a drop of 0.30% for the composite, and then 0.33% um, for the financial stock index. And last week, surprisingly, we didn't record any, um, any gainers on the market. We didn't see any uh, equity actually adding up to investors' capital. We had six equities losing on their week open values. And when you look at the top three equities that lost on the market, you realize uh, we had gold losing 2.03% to close at 1 CD 45 pesos. Um, car was the second, it lost one peso, that was one percent of its week open value. And then we saw GCB losing 0.82 percent as a third top loser. Um, other losers were EBG and the Standard Chartered Bank, they also lost on their week open values. And even Standard Chartered Bank lost further today on the market, it lost a peso and is currently at 16 CDs, 12 pesos per share. It has lost so much this year. And we at uh, GN Research and um, Gokos, we are anticipating that. There's not going to be a surprise turnaround for Standard Chartered Bank on the Ghana Stock Exchange because their four-year financials were not that impressive. And when you look at that, that is also having that negative sentiment about the equity on the market. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is that investors can hold on um, after some time when the share has fallen to its lowest point where it can fall further, mm -hmm. then they can take the opportunity and buy equities of Standard Chartered Bank for the long-term benefit. So that is what we're expecting. And when you look at the price of Standard Chartered Bank year on year basis, same time around this period, it was around 20 cities, 27 pesos. That was within, as of Friday, within the same time last year. And when you look at it on a 52 week basis, you realize that it has lost about 20.28%. So, this um, fundamentals and then the sentiment from investor side is actually having that negative impact, and we're still expecting some losses in Standard Chartered right. Bank. And then finally, let me just talk about EBG as well, which is now EGH. The share code for Ecobank Ghana Limited is now EGH on the Ghana Stock Exchange okay. is there. Uh, so when we say EGH, simply we're talking about um, Ecobank Ghana Limited. Right. EGH, you look at their four-year fundamentals. Last, last week, it lost, okay? But we are expecting it to make some gains this week. And even by end of April, we are expecting it to make about 5% um, year to date to, uh, to investors, like returns to investors. It's the NPL for EBG, EGH actually increased from 1.18 to about 3.71%, um, but that is still below the industry average of 25%. Okay. So there's still more room for EG, uh, All right, so EGH. So quickly before we go, I mean, let's throw um, some focus on the commodities. I mean, last week we saw um, oil, the price of oil going back and turning down again. Mm -hmm. back yes, back. last week it closed at, as at Friday, it closed at 40.26 um, US dollars per barrel. That was for crude oil. And as at around 2 p.m. today, when I checked mm -hmm. on the on the world market, I realized that it has fallen further to 38.39 US dollars per barrel. And when you compare it to its previous day's quote, or let's say last week's quote, it has gone down by 0.72%. But on a weekly okay. basis, realize that uh, crude oil, you look at cocoa, you look at gold, we saw both um, all equi uh, commodities declining on the world market. Mm -hmm. And as of today, let me say gold is also at $1,218.59 and then cocoa is at $2,893. Mm -hmm. US So there's still this drop on the world market and crude oil per se, it's likely to drop, drop further. further. Last week I mentioned it here that I read a particular article mm -hmm. that I get from um, the oil, like I get it from the international market, mm -hmm. and they're saying it's possible that it might even go below five dollars per barrel. But right. how how shall we, we that? We hope it doesn't get. It there. wouldn't get there. <laughs> we need the money, we need the revenue. Yes, yes, oil. yes, yes, and oh, other so African countries as well. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. You're welcome. For your time. That mm -hmm. was Beta Atubiga, stock market analyst today, ending today's edition of Business Live. Thank you very much for paying attention to us, and do join us again same time next week. Up next is Focus on Africa. My name is Emmanuel Abouadji Yafi.